This is VOA Africa. I'm Esther Gido Yuat. It's Thursday, July 18th. This is Africa 54. The World Health Organization declares Congo's Ebola outbreak an international emergency as the virus threatens neighboring countries. Boeing will pay out $50 million to families of those killed in two 737 MAX crashes. The announcement came as a grieving father slammed Boeing in dramatic testimony before the U.S. Congress. And my interview with Ohio University's professor Brooke Hailu Besha on discord inside Ethiopia's ruling party and calls for changes to the country's constitution. We begin our broadcast tonight in Central Africa, where a Congolese fish dealer that died of Ebola may have transported the deadly virus from Congo to Rwanda and Uganda, according to the World Health Organization. The WHO says the woman visited a market in Mpondwe, Uganda on July 11th, and is believed to have also traveled to Goma and Giseni in Rwanda. Meanwhile, the Ebola outbreak in the DRC has been declared an international health emergency by the WHO. Michelle Hennessy reports. The World Health Organization sounded a rare global alarm on Wednesday, declaring the Democratic Republic of Congo's Ebola outbreak an international emergency. It's only the fifth disease epidemic to have been given that status. Since the outbreak 11 months ago, almost 1,700 people have died. The WHO has previously said hundreds of millions of dollars are needed to prevent it from spreading and costing even more loss of life. Nearby countries are most at risk, but despite its emergency status, the WHO says it's not yet a global threat. It's calling on the international community to not place travel or trade restrictions on the unstable region. Site restrictions force people to use informal and unmonitored border crossings, increasing the potential for the spread of disease. Communities are helping to educate people on how to protect themselves from the disease. That and a campaign of vaccinations had helped keep it confined to two provinces in northeast Congo. But with the death of a pastor in a city of two million people, the WHO says there's, quote, worrying signs of a possible extension to the epidemic. Michelle Hennessy of Reuters with that report. Now, in a moving testimony Wednesday about the Boeing 737 MAX passenger jet and Boeing's leadership before the U.S. House Subcommittee on Aviation, Kenyan-Canadian citizen Paul Njoroge says he lost his wife, three children, and mother-in-law in the March crash of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. Njoroge says Boeing's leadership failed to disclose the problems with the plane's anti-stall system. He called the airline manufacturer's decision not to divulge the issue criminal. The Boeing 737 MAX crashes killed my wife, my three children, my mom-in-law, and 341 others. I think about the last six minutes a lot. My wife and my mom-in-law knew they were going to die. They had to somehow comfort the children during those final moments knowing they were all their last. I wish I was there with them. It never leaves me that my family's flesh is there in Ethiopia, mixed with the soil, the jet fuel, and pieces of the aircraft. Jaroge says grief has overwhelmed him, and he has not been able to return to his home in Canada. 
A political party representing some of Ethiopia's ethnic Sidama people said Thursday it would postpone plans to set up a new region in defiance of the federal government and would accept the offer of a referendum in five months. The plan to declare a new region would be a direct challenge to the federal government and could encourage eight other ethnic groups to make similar demands. Their demands come at a time when there are reports of factions and conflict within Ethiopia ruling People's Revolutionary Democratic Front Party. I spoke with Professor Brooke Hailu Besha of Ohio University and began by asking him what is the underlying problem? Uh, the case with Ethiopia is uh, complicated but not unexpected with the election of uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed uh, in April 2018 as Ethiopia's new premier. Some op op oppose his views because uh, fr press freedom and the political association and thousands of political prisoners were, were freed and those who were in exile, those who even undertook armed struggle in neighboring countries against the Ethiopian government, all were invited to come, to come in. Journalists all were released and Ethiopia became overnight uh, a, a, a rock star, so, so to speak and uh, internet and social media was opened up. But Professor, yeah. with all those accolades, with all mm. those achievements, Absolutely. he still has a lot of critics. Yes. Some even asking him to resign, some yes. calling him yeah. a traitor. Yes. So what is Why? the problem? Okay. There is freedom now, so people are unleashing their anger. Now with the opening, everybody wants to say something, everybody has an agenda, uh, everybody even criticizes him because they don't support him. And I think that's the beauty of democracy. Ethiopians should grow with it with the democratic space. Every, everybody has the right to say something, even unreasonable ones. Uh, and I support Avi for what he stands, for the sake of Ethiopia. But there are others who don't see, see it that way. So I think we should also do what? Uh, entertain their thoughts. But are they listening to the voices of those who are opposed to him? Uh, not all were happy with the coming to power of Avi. Shall I say the old guard? They were not for democracy. They were really people who were angry that they even lost power. Once he, he's like, he was like a fire brigade, once he's, he, he, he puts out the fire in West Ethiopia, another will pop up. Another will pop up in the north, in the west, in the east. So that was the problem. As to the Amhara regional state, that was um, uh, an inner party sort of struggle. Uh, there were groups, there are different parties in the Amhara region, the second largest populist state. They opposed the current leadership. They wanted, they, 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 they are saying that you don't represent fully the Amhara people. They, will, they want to take the Amhara state to a very extreme, uh, extremist way. The current government, which survived, has support from the Amhara people, but the other parties who are ultra-nationalist, they don't support it. Abiy uh, is supported by the majority, but still there are those who don't see eye to eye with him, especially those who, who support the ethnic federalism arrangement that they, that they put in place in the last 28 years. It's Would amending true. the current constitution <coughs> heal those divisions? Mm. What is the underlying issue yeah. with the current constitution? Ethiopia is a multi-ethnic state. Dividing Ethiopia based on ethnicity, not giving individual liberty, but this ethnic uh, solution mm. is the problem itself. On the other hand, minority groups, they really want to maintain also their uh, ethnic identity and things like that. So Abi is walking in a very tight rope. People, literal consensus is, we want change, but how do we go about the change? Should we totally get rid of ethnicity? So this is the number one agenda, I would say, that the Abiy uh, regime and Ethiopian intellectuals are trying to chip in. So what options does Abiy have at this point? They are at the policy level studying it to find the ABCD kind of options. One is to have a constitutional amendment, and that has to be initiated in parliament and in the respective each governments. People are saying that we should wait for the next year's election and once a new government comes to power, then the new, one of the tasks of the new government is to, to make an over, total overhaul of the federalist system as a structure, state structure, as well as amend, uh, amend uh, change the respective constitution as such. What is the future of Ethiopia yeah, yeah. like right now? Yeah. The people are concerned in Ethiopia. They want peace. They want stability and progress. I, I predict in the coming few uh, months, the IPRDF will collapse totally. So they're going to realign themselves. The, the main party, up to now, will stand by itself and try to jockey for power and try to alienate and attract other groups. So we're going to have two forces. And in politics, what do you do? Based on your objectives and needs, you try to reconfigure it and jockey for, uh, for, for power. That was Professor Brooke Hailu Besha of Ohio University.
It's time now to head to Cairo, where Africa 54 sports reporter Sande Shomari is standing by. Hello, Sande. Nigeria is taking home the bronze medal after last night's game. How are their fans reacting? Yes, Esther, Nigeria is now going home with a bronze medal. This is a consolation, if you will, Esther. And last night, the fans were very happy chanting Nigeria, Nigeria, oh, this is a famous song up in here, Esther. But anyway, it was a great night for Nigerians. And tonight, Esther, things are different in this city because Nigerians are going home very happy. I spoke to so many of their fans. They are very excited and very happy to see what they could do because this team has been in this position only in 2013. And then they missed other positions to play in this type of football. So it was a very good opportunity for the country, consolation for everybody. Now, a goose soup is ready <laughs> to be enjoyed by everybody. <laughs> a goose soup, okay. Now, Sunday, you know, excitement is very high right now. And all eyes will be on Cairo tomorrow, Friday, because Senegal and Algeria will be sweating it, as we say, to get that cup, the Africa Cup of Nations 2019. How are the teams preparing? Esther, these teams, they can tell you this is the day they have been always waiting for. Senegal has not been in this position since 2002 when they played on the finals. And Algeria, the last time around, they were champions was 1990. So this is a great game of football that we're waiting. Is history in the making, Esther. So. I spoke to one of the analysts following this Cup 2019 all the way from Kenya, Timothy Lubulu. And I wanted to know his take on this final coming up tomorrow night. Tough game. Uh, I think this is the final everybody wanted. Uh, every, uh, most locals actually wanted Egypt to be in the final. But uh, looking at uh, the balance of the teams from the group stages up to here, Tunisia, uh, Senegal and uh, Algeria looked like uh, the most likely final. It's going to be a very good match. Two teams who are well able to contain the pressure that comes with the final, very experienced players. And the most interesting thing is to see that the final is being contested by two African coaches. Very interesting is the fact that they were raised up in the same place. They are of the same age, only separated by a day. So all the pre-match uh, talk and water view is really spicing up the, uh, the match already. Sunday, that's a great prediction there. We'll be watching. Yes. So you're going to get your gusto soup and uh, you're going to get your popcorn. <laughs> Sunday, we will talk tomorrow. I hope so. All right. <laughs> oh, we, okay. Sunday, all right. Keep, keep talking. <laughs> sure, Esther. One more thing that I can tell you. Where I am right now, this is Zambalek Hotel, Cairo, where the CAF offices are located right behind me. And this morning, they had a general assembly whereby they had an executive committee selection and this election one won all the new members are here and we have a new member from the east african bloc moses from uganda the fufa president of uganda became the next executive member of the board beating tanzanians lady gatenga who was the executive uh, committee member this election was done this morning in this building and now Esther they're getting ready for the draw for the next uh, 2021 African Cup of Nations in Cameroon so now they're drawing which all other right, teams sir. Sunday will be did, did you talk to somebody that position all right let's hear it who is going to win it depends on who is the strongest but we will like to win the cup. <laughs> Do you think Senegal has been playing well? At the beginning, yes, but after we were a bit worried, and hopefully they are going to catch up again. Since we got to this point, hopefully they will make us and Senegal happy. Of course we are Senegalese. We are going to watch the final like all Senegalese. We are proud of our team. It is the second time, the second final. We are going to win the cup and bring it to Senegal. Why not? We are proud.
Dave and May here in the studio. I'm excited about tomorrow. So it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Sunday, Africa 54 Sports Guru, Sunday Shomari, reporting for us live from Cairo. All right, we'll be back. Stay with us. Bentu, Arabic, it is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I am Sheka Sully, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We'll pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. In today's business report, Zimbabwe's ban on foreign currency and the nation's record inflation has spurred demand for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin to try to preserve wealth. Zimbabwean authorities last year banned banks from processing Bitcoin and is now warning that cryptocurrencies are open to hacking. Columbus Mavunga has more from Harare. Dennis Kadengu for two years has been buying as much cryptocurrency as he can afford. He uses Bitcoin to buy and sell online, which he can't do with the Zimbabwe's currency as it is worthless outside the country. Bitcoin, I think, uh, is the most safest uh, cryptocurrency. And uh, in terms of uh, safety, you can uh, have um, a large amount of money um, in equivalent to the fiat, which are the USDs and um, the euros having it on your person, moving it around, even in seconds, which is um, um, very, very uh, um, beneficial, rather than carrying a large bag of USDs on person. Cryptocurrency traders were further boosted when authorities in June banned the use of foreign currencies and reissued the Zimbabwe dollar. The currency was abandoned in 2009 after hyperinflation of 500 billion percent made it worthless. Last month, Zimbabwe's inflation rate hit a record high, 175 percent, raising fears it could happen again. We, we've seen a lot of people now are coming, coming to us to say, I want to move uh, X amount of money, or I want to purchase a car um, in Japan. And stuff like that and uh, yeah we, we are accommodating them so yeah it's it's really a, a huge advantage to our side and uh, I think also um, it will it will enhance our business in the long run exchanges like Golix were affected when Zimbabwe last year banned banks from trading cryptocurrency in citing risks major issues that they had with uh, the use of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies was uh, people getting scammed, and also they had the fear of uh, money being laundered through Bitcoin. Researchers say Zimbabwe is right to be cautious as cryptocurrencies are volatile and unregulated. For Zimbabwe, I think we are still a long way off the mark in terms of that necessary infrastructure. So un until and unless we have that physical infrastructure and also the regulatory infrastructure to be able to regulate the activities around the digital currency, I think it will be difficult uh, for us to embrace them and for that to have a quite positive spin-off uh, for the country. But for investors like Hadengu, the benefits of cryptocurrency outweighs the risks which are no worse than the uncertainty of Zimbabwe dollars. Columbus Mavunga for VOA News, Harare.
As America and the world celebrates the 50th anniversary of the historic mission to land humans on the surface of the moon, VOS Ken Parabao rep uh, presents this reflection of the monumental achievement through the eyes of the NASA astronauts themselves. In exclusive VOA interviews, Farabao gathered the men of the Apollo program to reflect on the path to the moon and what lies beyond. The Voice of America, New York here. In 1957, I was a Fulbright student in Norway and I was out in the field uh, uh, gathering uh, geological information. The only uh, American radio I could get was Voice of America out of Algiers. And it was uh, during one of the Willis-Conover broadcasts of Jazz from A to Z that they interrupted and, uh, and announced that the then Soviet Union had launched the first artificial satellite of the Earth, which was Sputnik 1. And that's when I finally decided, well, I better start paying attention to space. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. When President Kennedy made the announcement we were planning to go to the moon and get there before the end of the decade, I really couldn't believe it. I said, no, I, I mean, he's just saying this thing to give us confidence, but I don't think that's possible. No nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Exceptionalism in space, being number one, being a leader, anything less than that is unacceptable to the people of this nation. It is a very dramatic expression of what can happen if you assemble the right people, the right skills that work together as a team with the right leadership, what miracles can happen. It was a wonderful example of organization within a large government agency. We invested a good bit of time, effort, and human endeavors to gain that leadership with the Apollo program. This is the voice of America's Apollo 11 News Center. It is burning, it's moving. The rocket is lifting off the pad. It's lifting beautifully into the sky. The next critical point in the lunar landing flight comes in about two hours from now. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The space program was a positive that gave people inspiration and help about what this country was doing. Uh, here's the way we've had a problem. Apollo 13 was what a prepared team can do. The team that was trained to handle emergencies like that and like many other things did their job with great credit. I was the uh, flight director for Apollo 17 when uh, Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt lifted off. We read a message up from the president that basically stated this may be the last time in this century. Yeah, this was a very bittersweet time for us because we were surrendering our drive as a nation to uh, be explorers. We'll go back to the moon. My friend Neil Armstrong thought that uh, going back to the moon was a proper and necessary precursor to a Mars expedition. To say that I thought it would be 50 or 60 years before Americans were back on the moon, uh, I would not have guessed that at all. It surprises me uh, from the way I felt at the time that we hadn't been to Mars. I'm a Martian. Uh, I think Mars is the next great destination. I'm looking forward to the 50th anniversary because that can be and should be a very crucial reaffirmation time of the pathway that we chart. For more on the Apollo 2 50th anniversary celebrations and historic landing on the moon, I'm joined by Claude Porcella, former VOA French to Africa Service Chief, who was among the journalists who covered the historic occasion. Claude, welcome to Africa 54. Welcome again. I've seen you here before, but I see you again for the first time on TV. Tell me what you remember most. Well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, of course, there were a lot of memorable moments, but... Uh, because we are not on that much time. The, the thing I, I remember, besides the launch, which was very, very impressive, the, the power of Saturn V, 
uh, the, the ground shook, you know. And I still uh, feel in, in my guts, inside myself, the vibration, you know, when uh, the, the, the ground shook and, uh, and we saw the, the Saturn V uh, uh, going toward the sky. And everybody was uh, uh, chanting, uh, go baby, go. <laughs> But the, the other moment that uh, I uh, really remember, and uh, it's, it stays in, with me, is uh, when uh, Neil Armstrong uh, put uh, his foot on the moon and uh, pronounced his uh, now very famous uh, few words, uh, uh, little step for a man, but uh, a leap of, uh, a giant leap for, uh, for humanity. And what happened, we were uh, about over 1,000 journalists at the time, in a huge uh, press room. And uh, when uh, Armstrong started to walk on the moon, there was this huge explosion of joy, you know, enthusiasm. And uh, as you know, as journalists, we are supposed to keep a poker gambler face and uh, not show our, our feelings. But, at this moment, you know, we, we became human, if I can say, for a few seconds, few minutes. And we wanted to share the joy and the enthusiasm, not only of the American people, but for the, of the entire world. So that's, that's a, a picture that has stayed in my mind over the last uh, five decades. So what do you think that this monumental undertaking, that America took that giant leap that, you know, it hasn't even happened again since then, has had on the world, and especially now in the digital age, what should we be thinking next? Well, like, uh, I think it's Mike Collins in the little report you showed before, who said now everybody, of course, is uh, thinking of Mars. But uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'll see it. <laughs> but uh, probably not before 2030. So now the, the, the goal is to go back to the moon. And that's what President Trump wants, you know. And uh, he's becoming a, a, little, uh, a little mad because it takes a lot of time. They are trying to uh, build a new, a, new set, uh, a, new, a new rocket to send uh, the astronaut to the moon. And don't forget that uh, since uh, 1970s, 70s, the 70s, uh, uh, when uh, the Apollo program finally ended, you know, uh, we didn't have a, a launcher, you know, and we were <laughs> it's kind of humiliating. But we had to turn to the to the Soviets, you know, and now the Russians, and they are the one who carry the load to the, the to the space station. Mm -hmm. So, of, of course, we, we need, uh, we need uh, a, new, a new launcher. And what we have seen, you know, after the, the mission, uh, after 1972, uh, the interest for space declined. It came back with the, right. the, right. the shuttle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now we are back that uh, we are talking yeah. to go back to the moon. Wow. Claude, thank you very much oh. for that interesting uh, 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 point of view. Well, Claude Pocella is former BOA French to Africa Service Chief, and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.